Claiming that you yourself are behaving ethically is not a sufficient standard. It's not enough. Data is having a really broad impact on all of our lives, but we can't always see it, which makes this a really interesting topic to research. So we all carry cell phones around with us now, mobile phones. And when we use them, we're emitting data about ourselves. It's this constant stream of data that's coming out of our devices that tells where we are, what we're doing. When it's analyzed, it can tell what our job is, what our income level is, what our emotional state is, what our relationships are like, how happy or unhappy we are, how many children we have. It tells everything about us. Even the simplest data set from your mobile phone with just showing your location tells things about you you could never even imagine. As I see it, and as surveillance study scholars see it, this could be called a data double. This is a double of you. It's a ghost self that you have that is out there in the world doing work. It's doing work for the corporations that gather the data and the corporations that they pass it on to that analyze the data. We don't know what that work is. So all of us have a data double out there in the world that's working and that's producing you know, tradable goods. And none of us know what work it is they're doing. And that's why I'm doing the, the research that I'm doing on data justice, because I think that we need to apply principles of justice to the work that our data doubles are doing, as well as to the ordinary real world we live in. So it's a collective problem, really. And we're very bad at addressing collective problems. When we see discussions about this happen in the political sphere, in the economic sphere, in the, in the research sphere as well, we're hearing people talk a lot about personal data and about the GDPR and how we manage personal data and how we need to develop better tools for data awareness, data literacy, for helping people manage their own stuff as if it were an asset you could pin down, like in your bank account, you know? And you allow the bank to use your money and investments so they can make you interest, but really it's your money and you can go take it out of the bank. Intuitively, everyone knows that's not how data functions. Intuitively, we all understand that it's a much broader issue about how information about us flows through different companies and different modes of analysis and how it gets picked up at different points along the line and products are made of it. But ultimately, data spreads and flows and data reproduces. You know, it doesn't sit there like an asset. And the problem of data justice is weighing between being a citizen and being an individual and being private and being public. And to live in society, we need to give up data about ourselves. We give up data about ourselves all the time. We have phone conversations with people. We do our work. We communicate with people when we do our work. We communicate with people out in the street. We communicate very importantly with our government and with our municipalities. We give them basic facts about ourselves as part of the social contract, you might almost say, because I register with a municipality. I tell them my name and my address and my job and whether I'm married or divorced and how many children I have whether I'm an immigrant, you know, all of these things. That's not a problem, I do it willingly, because I trust them that they are treating me like a citizen and that the data flow is gonna be directed towards providing services, protecting me, providing for my needs and engaging in dialogue with me. The government doesn't have a lot of really expert data analytics specialists. They tend to rely on contractors, right? They rely on contractors such as social media giants, for instance, who collect a lot of data and market it on in various forms. Phone companies who also collect a lot of data, if you wanna plan traffic structures, for instance, in a city now, you buy lots of anonymized data from a cell phone company that shows you where, where everybody's moving. If you wanna know about how busy a place is on a given festival day, you probably wanna look on Google. And this is true for states too, they recognize this is important data. But what it does is it breaks this citizenship link with the state about data, and it makes it very diverse and it makes it very fuzzy, and it means that people can no longer track who they're giving data to that may be used for administrative purposes by the authorities. And so I find this a really interesting tension because it may be necessary, it may be inevitable, but we aren't really making rules about it. We're not having a good discussion about what it means for our society. We're not talking about when we might want to put a break on it, how we can red, you know, recognize moments of red flags that say people's privacy is being invaded. We're not having that discussion. Instead, we're talking as if commerce and the state were completely separate in processing our data, and they're not anymore. And that's a really important conversation to have. 
So my research studies broadly how we should have that conversation. It asks what kind of governance measures are available to us, what kind of institutions are available to us, are those doing the job? And we ask individuals and we ask tech companies and we ask government itself and we ask all sorts of people, are they doing the job? And generally the answers we're hearing are, no, we're all pretty confused right now. We all have good intentions. We'd like to understand more about this, but we don't know what doing the job of governance looks like right now. The parameters seem to have changed on us very, very quickly. And we're struggling to catch up. And we feel like we ought to be using big data and big data analytics and artificial intelligence more than we are. We don't know quite what happens if we use them more. We don't know what it would look like to find a situation where we really shouldn't use them. And so we wind up in, in a huge experiment right now where we're trying big data methods and analytics and we're trying AI in all sorts of different fields, some of which are gonna turn out to be a bad idea, some of which are gonna be revolutionary and fantastic. And we don't always have good tests for which they are. A lot of this gets translated into a simple cost-benefit analysis, as if you could understand the knock-on effects of this huge data transition we're going through, this datafication of the world. I think it's on the level of using oil and then discovering we're in the middle of climate change. I think this is what we're getting into here. I think oil, when it was first used, was revolutionary and fantastic and economically really beneficial and enabled all sorts of new technologies to grow up and the world wouldn't be the same if we hadn't discovered oil. However, we also know it would have been really great if we'd understood all of the subsequent effects of using a lot of oil. I think this is not even up for debate anymore. So people have been calling data the new oil for a long time now, for a good decade. If it really is the new oil, then we need to think in a multidimensional way about what kind of problems it might create. Because we don't want to wind up in a climate change situation in terms of the way data affects society. My assumption is not that it will destroy the planet. It's not, it's not like that. But the idea that we don't know should lead us to behave differently than we are today. We should learn from the past. We should learn from oil. We should learn from the way that companies behave and what they produce when they're completely unregulated. You know, there are lots of spheres in which this has happened. Another great comparator for this is the derivatives trading that led to the crash in 2008, where we had some thinking tools, but not quite enough to understand what was getting traded, how it was made, and what the future effects of that might be. So there were indications out there that the derivatives that were getting traded in the market were not stable, that they were junky, that they were not worth as much money as they seemed to be worth and as, as much money as was being paid for them. But we didn't have a coordinated way of picking up on those signals of risk. Instead, we trusted to the experts and we trusted that if anything really bad was happening, then something would be triggered and something would happen. But what was actually happening was a very strong discourse of the market and of the good that's created by economic growth. And as long as growth was happening, people felt there was no need for red flags, for triggers, for governance. And so the people who are capable of understanding didn't look hard enough, and everybody who was capable of pushing them didn't push at all. And I feel like that's where we're at with the data market right now. We need to take a more skeptical view, just like we do of everything else. We don't want to live in a, in a society, in a global society with ubiquitous surveillance. We don't want to live in a society with perfect discrimination, which is actually one of the arguments that's being made for extensive and ubiquitous data collection, is that it can lead to a situation where you really don't have to pay much for insurance as long as you behave yourself. And things can be targeted very specifically to you. There are unintended consequences to this. If you live in a world with perfect discrimination between those who are a good risk and those who are a bad risk financially, this really affects the rights of those who are considered a bad risk. It's also not a perfect calculation. You may look like a bad risk and not actually be. But if we sort of reify, if we give reality to this suggestion that we can discriminate perfectly and understand everyone using super hyper granular data and granular analysis, we're kind of justifying perfect discrimination. And I don't think that's a place we want to live in. And I think also the ethics conversation that we're in with the technology firms is not a good one right now. I think ethics is being used as an argument for self-regulation with the idea that if we can just come up with the right guidelines, AI will become safe. 
ethics hasn't proved a get out of jail free card for any industry in the history of the world. And yet we're trying to take the most powerful socio-technical infrastructure of our, of our time on our planet and subject it just to ethical scrutiny. A lot of that scrutiny is not even being done by ethicists. It's being done on the basis of individual scientists and researchers and employees being able to tell what the actual costs of their work may be down the line. And this is something in philosophy called a many hands problem, that individual employees at a company may be doing completely ethical work with data, but the company's own objectives may not be ethical. The knock-on effects of the work of the company may be emergent and may be really problematic. We build things and we don't know exactly what effect they're going to have in the world. And so claiming that you yourself are behaving ethically is not a sufficient standard. It's not enough. And so what we should do broadly is not address this as something that we can solve through any single strategy or any single grouping of people. If you get together the 50 people that can tell you what to do about AI, that in itself is problematic. Right? What you need is dynamic governance. And by dynamic governments, I mean the governance, I mean the opposite of guidelines. You know, I don't mean that we should work without guidelines or laws or regulation. I think we absolutely need all those things. And research ethics and privacy laws and absolutely we need all the tools in our arsenal to direct at this large scale phenomenon. But I, I think that you can't pin it down enough that you can say guidelines will work. You can't pin it down enough to say, here are the ethics of this thing and this will solve it. It's like talking about developing a democracy. You know, democracy in the 1600s looked very different than it does now. It was run by property-owning white men in small subsections of rich places. And yet it was a useful starting point for the idea of democracy, which we'd taken from people 2,000 years ago, who also only incorporated a very tiny portion of the population in their democracy, in their decision-making. And so we can see the development of, of democracy as something really dynamic and interesting and useful because it's dynamic. There are lots of different kinds of democracy around the planet. There are lots of different ways of thinking about how the people should represent their views and their needs. And that's okay. I see this as one possible future for our data economy, that we have lots of different data democracies and that those develop along their own lines and that they're directed by the experience of particular groups and the priorities of those groups. I don't think we're going to wind up sharing priorities that map perfectly onto those of people across the planet from us. But I think if we don't negotiate priorities amongst different regions and different groups of people, then we're really in trouble too. If we can't agree on what basic human rights with regard to data should tackle, we're in big trouble. If we can't agree on what we think suitable principles of privacy between governments and citizens are, then I think also we're in big trouble. I think if we can't agree on what kind of ethical direction we think technology should take, we're in big trouble again. The market is this huge push-pull you know, environment where views on what data can do and what it should do are getting negotiated, but they're getting negotiated by the most powerful and the richest on behalf of all of us. And I don't think that's the only forum where they should get negotiated. We have ways to put boundaries around things that are important to us, and we don't, don't seem to be applying them in this sphere. We're just using the language of competition, which I think will create a race to the bottom. You know, if the answer is, if we don't develop this kind of AI, the Chinese will, that's not a conversation I want to be in. <laughs> I don't think that's a productive conversation. The idea that if we don't do something, someone else will is never a good way to start. I think we should start from a higher level and we should say, what can we distinguish that we think everybody is interested in? What are the things that everybody feels are risky? What are the things that people are experiencing as negative right now? And I think there may be commonalities there. I don't think we have to go to individual country cases and look for problems. You can look for solutions. You can look for experiences. You can look for what people talk about when they talk about data and see if there are commonalities there. I hear people in the US making a strong argument that, that tech companies shouldn't be regulated at all. And I think that partly comes out of a pressure that says regulation is the way to deal with this. We have to shut this down. We have to shut parts of it down. At least we have to stop things happening. 
there is a place for that, but as a dialogue, you know, it's, it's an argument that people are making rather than a single reality. And I think as soon as you get into imposing your single reality on others, you're in trouble if you want to create justice. You know, justice is something we need to understand rather than enforce on others. Understand what is good and what is bad in a general sense about using my data. I don't want to feel responsible for directing the work of the data market or for directing how governments use my data. I want to be able to trust more than I do. And I want more demonstrations of trustworthiness. I want more ways to verify the things that I'm trusting. And I want not to be subjected to marketing discourse about political things, political questions. I don't want to be told that in order to participate in a growing digital economy, I have to give up all sorts of data about me that is potentially very harmful to not even me, but my grandchildren. Taking a longitudinal view of this, my grandchildren will be judged based on data that I met today. And asking me to understand how that might happen and guard myself and my grandchildren against that is nonsense. It's pure, unadulterated nonsense. And yet that's sort of the system we live in right now. The idea that basic protections involve, that the basic principles of protection are that you know what data is being created about you and you can control those data, that's increasingly nonsense. That doesn't protect my grandchildren from inferences made from my behavioral data that cannot be made given current technological development. You know, what I want is a world where data doesn't flow about me to everybody by default. I want a world where the default is for data not to flow.